Happy Friday, everyone. Okay, so I've been working kind of nonstop on geometry stuff, feels like, this past week. Um, and uh, both for work and for you guys, and for this class. Um, but today, I've got quite a, a challenging curriculum for us today. We're all going to be drawing something that's very, very difficult to draw. So we're going to spend most of our time drawing today. Uh, but I also want to let you know, I just posted online a new discovery. And it's right here. That there is even an easier way to uh, solve the squaring of the circle, which is always a good thing to do because it helps balance you, gets you in the right mind frame, both uh, from the perspective of um, masculine and feminine energy and positive and negative and all those things basically working together. So uh, basically, I'm gonna show you guys what this is right here. I use my new holder here. There we go, hopefully you guys can see that better now. Okay, cool. So basically what this is, is the squaring of the circle. And last time, you remember, we learned it by drawing concentric circles out and you have like the fourth uh, square would overlap the fifth circle, right? Which was kind of cool. But I found a whole nother way to draw it that is even much easier. I just found this today. I already knew that if you measure this angle, right? Of where the square is overlapping the circle, this is our circle that we want to square perfectly. If you measure this angle right here, um, it ends up to be 51.8436. Let's see if we can line this up perfectly. And we can see our 50 right here. And it's just before the 52 line, which is right there, which is right there. So uh, it matches perfectly, which happens to be the exact slope angle of the Great Pyramid. And that's probably why the Great Pyramid is the slope angle that it is, because it's representing a balance of masculine and feminine energy. And there's also another reason, which I'll go into in just a moment, but just to show you how this is done first and foremost, what I did was simply took a radius, in this particular case, my radius is three, as you can see here. So there's my three inches. And uh, as I was playing with this, I noticed that, well, an easy way to do this, instead of just basically taking the circumference and then dividing it by four, and then trying to figure out a square, and then how to place that square is always a challenge. What I figured out was all you have to do is multiply um, the radius length, which is the three inches here, by one over 0.8888888888 infinitely. Now, because that will allow us to create a new radius of a new circle, which is this larger circle right here. It's easy to remember. It's just one over 0 0.8888888. Uh, or the, the reciprocal value of that, of course, is 1.1250. So it's not irrational. This side of it would be a repeating rational. And it creates another circle, which is likewise feminine and irrational. And so all you then have to do is circumscribe or inscribe rather, a uh, square inside of that second circle, and then it will perfectly square the inner circle. So there must be some metaphor in there uh, because I've never seen that done this way before, but that actually is a really clean way to do it because what I wrote here is the perfect square of the circle possesses a half diagonal equal to the diagonal of this square, what would be from here to here, right? or if we broke it into two right triangles, it would be the hypotenuse length, right? A half diagonal equal to the radius of the circle, right? Multiplied by one over 0.8888888 infinitely. And in my number theory, the number one represents darkness, feminine. It also represents uh, vacuum, gravity, and time. And the number eight represents its opposite, which is light. So we have a veritable yin and yang relationship here with one over 0.8888 infinitely. 
and that gives us this perfect balance of the square of the circle, and I've never seen it done this way before. I had looked it up to see if anyone else had. Another thing that's interesting is that this uh, angle of 51.8436 degrees, as I mentioned before, is actually relational to phi, right? Which is 1.618, right? Divided by pi. And so 3.1416 is gonna then give me 0 0.515036. Now, if I convert that to degrees and move the decimal point, here it goes 51, 50 minutes. So this is 51 degrees, 50 minutes, and 36 seconds. If you put that into a calculator online, you can find degree to um, a compass measurement, right, and vice versa. If you pop that in, it will come out to be exactly 51.8436 degrees. So the slope angle of the Great Pyramid is the mathematics of phi divided by pi. It's just rendered in minutes and seconds rather than in, uh, in decimal. And the conversion from minutes to seconds is very simple. You just simply take 50 minutes divided by 60, right? And that gives you this 0.833333. Then you take 36 and divide that by 60, and that gives you the rest of the balance. And those would be the seconds then converted into the decimal, which happens to be the same in this particular case. So another way to look at this is that 518436 degrees, which is derived from this number right here. If I subtract that from 90 degrees, it's closest right angle, right? Then the difference is 38.1564 degrees. And I noticed just today as well that that 0.3816 approximately um, of, uh, you know, converted in decimal from degrees, take that same number, multiply it by 360 degrees. So 0.381564 times 360 degrees gives me again 137.36. Now 137 is one over, so 137, right, is one over the mathematical and physics constant alpha, which defines the separation of light from darkness. So if you have energy and you apply it to an electron, you might remember from chemistry class, the threshold energy that will make it either absorb a photon or jump to an outer shell of the same uh, nucleus would be the alpha constant, which is a value of 00729735. And one over that value equals 137. So interesting that the slope angle of the Great Pyramid is coming out again relational to this 137 number. And how does 137 relate to phi? Well, very simple. Let's take 360 divided by 137.36304, or sorry, 360 minus, minus 137.36304 equals 222.6369 degrees. If I take that number and divide it again by 360, I'm back to 0.618, which is the golden number, right? So the golden number has two iterations. One is phi, which is 1.618. The other one is little phi, which is 0.618. And what's interesting is that this is the only number that does this, where 1 over or 1 over phi equals little phi. That's a very unique thing, right? Another thing that's interesting about phi is that you can take 1 plus phi, 1.618, equals phi squared. So that would equal 2.618. The golden number is the only number that does this. And then if I take the 1 over x value of this, so 1 over that value, it gives me 0.3819 
which comes out to be right in this exact same category right here, you know, 0 0.000 um, three different from where the slope angle of the pyramid is. Fascinating, right? So the perfect square of the circle can be made in such a simplistic way. And all you have to remember is that to find that radius, right, to, to, to know exactly the half diagonal or the full diagonal of the hypotenuse of this right triangle here, is going to be exactly the radius here multiplied by one over 0.888888 infinitely. And then that's gonna give you a new radius here. Draw a circle and then let's inscribe perfectly on the 45 degree points, this square, and that will perfectly square the smaller circle. So there you go. You learn something new. I just learned that today. Just found it today. So, now we're gonna take on a big challenge here. <laughs> this one's not easy. So to start off with, what you guys need to do is you need to draw a circle. Now, I was specifically requested to show how to draw this thing. It might take us a couple classes because this is not easy. But what, um, what you need to first start off by doing is you need to draw your circle, and I would try to make the circle very large in this particular case. So draw your circle, and you're going to uh, inscribe within it two pentagons. Okay, so two pentagons to start off with. So you're gonna start with a pentagon, and we know that one pentagon, so here's my 90 degree point right here, right? So let's say this is zero, this is 180, and this is 270. So if I'm gonna put a pentagon on here, then I'm gonna know that my first angle of incidence is gonna be right here, which is gonna be at 72 degrees. Okay, and I can use my measurement to get there, or I can draw it the way that I showed you how to draw it yesterday, butt it up against a hexagon. But then you really need a big piece of paper, so I didn't do it like that today. And, and so each of these points then would be, this is gonna be um, 36 degrees, so I can measure that too. So 36, there it is, it's perfectly on 36 degrees. And then this is gonna be 18 degrees higher than that. So it's gonna be 54 degrees, because I'm actually putting in here a 20 point, a 20 sided polygon. That's how you could think of it. But I'm gonna basically have to draw a whole bunch of lines in here to draw the hexapentacus. So the first thing you'll do is you'll make pentagon going this way, then you're going to do an upside down pentagon where the peak of the pentagon will be here. This one will have a peak of the pentagon here. And then you'll have another pentagon that'll have a peak here and you'll have a peak here. So now you've got four pentagons for 20 points, four times five points, is going to give me this. Then what you have to do is you have to draw a line from each point to each and every other point. That's a lot. <laughs> right, so it's very simple. I already started doing that so that uh, so it wouldn't take forever to do it. And you know, we can put out here even the other points that would be the outer points. This is not as necessary, but you know, I'm this is how I would draw a perfect 20 point, um, 20 sided polygon right here. So I would just keep drawing it out like this, and if you notice it's always 18 degrees apart from each other. And 18, also fundamental because 18 represents a half turn of a circle. So I'm just gonna go ahead and trace out here all the outer lines of this 20-sided polygon, which is what I start off with to make the 5-6 buckyball or fullerene or hexapentacus truncated icosahedron. I don't really like to call it fullerene so much because even though Bucky was a really amazing guy, he didn't create this. It is one of the Archimedean solids. It's been around since Archimedes. So why people call it, you know, the fullerene, I don't really know because it's not really any different. But it is a fundamentally important geometry for sure. And Bucky was uh, famous for making it 
you know, things like the Epcot Center's uh, geodesic design. And you've seen this many times over and over again. Sometimes you'll see it as pentagons made it up against hexagons. Sometimes you'll see it as a whole bunch of triangles inside it as well. So you can break up a pentagon, of course, into five triangles, and you can break up a hexagon into six triangles. Okay, so now I'd already started on some of this, so I've already started doing this. And uh, what's, what's really important is you wanna make sure that you connect the, uh, the, the ones that are four apart from each other. So for example, right? So this would be a starting point. Um, this would be a starting point, this would be a starting point. So I would take one, two, three, four, right? And I would basically mark that line, right? So I'll make it a little bolder for you guys to see it. Okay, now I'm trying to make a frame around this. And so I need to basically mark that. I'll mark this on all of these going around. So let's just do that real quick because this is a, this is a really critical element of this. So, so one, two, three, four. So I need to go back to this one, right? And I know that I'm gonna mark this line, right? So this would be a line that I'm gonna mark and I'm gonna mark it right here, right? And then by the same token, one, two, three, four. So I'll mark this line right here as well, okay? And I'm gonna keep going around just like that. Now, in order to get this, all the lines of the hexapentacus in this, you've got to draw a whole bunch of lines. Now, what happens is when you first draw this first round of this, you end up with a circle inside of here that looks relatively empty. And so then you mark on the 72 degrees line on the zero, 360, and on 288 and 216, and on the uh, 144 line. And I'll go ahead and mark all these lines for you as well. And you'll recognize all these numbers are related to music. The pentagon really has such a fundamental role in, in creating music. And that's why the perfect fifth is also so important. So this is gonna be, um, well, let's see. So we're gonna be 18, so 124, 126. And actually all of these are musical notes. And I'll go ahead and mark these as musical notes so you'll be able to remember it too. So, um, so let's start from 72 degrees is a D, right? If I converted that directly into Hertz, even though we have to go through this conversion, it still holds its place geometrically. So let's say this is the geometrical position for a D note, so D. And then you've got 90, which doubles to 180, which doubles to 360, 360 is F sharp. 108 doubles to 216, doubles to 432, which gives me an A. 126 gives me a C note. 144 is back to D again. And 288, which you're gonna find over here, right? 288 right here, will then also be a D. And then we're going to add, um, so that's gonna be 162. And you'll remember and recognize that note because that is also related to five, one, six, one, eight. So 162 uh, comes out to be an E note and 180 is F sharp. Okay, now this is gonna go to, um, let's see, it's gonna be 198. All right, 198 I believe is a G sharp. And then this goes to 216. 216 is a note A. It's half of 432, which we know is the note A. And then you've got um, 234. Now, whenever you see these numbers like 432 and it's palindrome, which is 234, a palindrome just means the number is backwards. That's it. So 234 is going to be a B note. And then this is all in just tuning, just the same type of scale we learned yesterday. Okay, and then this is going to go to 252, 
which is again a C note. And then um, 270 is gonna double to 540, which is a C sharp. And then it goes to 288, and then 288 uh, is gonna go to uh, 206, uh, no, no, 306, excuse me, 306. All right, 306 is 612. Um, gosh, is that an E flat? I think, I think it's an E. So 306 is gonna be 153. I think that's an E. Put a question mark next to that because I have to check it. And then this is going to go to three, um, 324. So another interesting permutation of 432. 324, 648, that gives me a B note. And then 360 is again at F sharp. Okay, and we talked about the significance of F sharp yesterday. And 360, so this is going to be 342 now. Now another permutation of 432. So just a rearranging of the numbers. And that's going to be a uh, B. That's going to be an F. F. There you go. So 18 doubles to 36. 36 doubles to 72. So that's a D. 36 is again a D note. And 54 is half of 108, which was an A note. So if we wanted to, we could even put what octave they're basically sitting in here. So how cool is that? So you're starting off with a D and then another D and then an A and then a D. Now, if we were to play this in music, this would sound like a D uh, chord. So you have a very low D, then the next octave D, then an A, then a D again, and then an F sharp and an A, and we're making a D major chord from that, and then it transitions over so that we now have F sharp, A, C, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A, B, C, C sharp, D, E, B, F, and then F sharp, back to, back to the circle at the end. So very interesting how this all basically aligns up musically, which is not surprising at all. But let's go ahead and draw out all the other lines because I haven't drawn out all the lines. Remember, each one of these points has to connect to all the other points. So hopefully while I was talking, doing that, you guys would, were starting to do that work because it's a lot of work. So let's uh, go to here. Now what'll happen is there'll be another circle that'll get formed in here and we're gonna put an upside down pentagon inside this because it's gonna tell us where to place that pentagon and then it's gonna be in perfect aspect ratio, perfect perspective. It's kind of amazing how this works. So now let's just connect the dots, that's all we're doing. Connect the dots and then try to put our thinking cap on to decipher this mess of lines and turn it into a beautiful hexapentacus truncated icosahedron, which by the way is the exact shape of the coronavirus. Not just the coronavirus, there are many things that take on this shape. It's a fundamental shape of, of nature. It's a, necessary, it's a necessary shape. Okay, so I've now connected, as you can see, each of these points. I'll fold this one up just a little bit so you guys can see it. Make sure that everyone's doing well on the Facebook page. Okay, good. Don't be too intimidated by this. I know this looks like a lot of lines, but we're gonna figure it out. Don't you worry, okay? So this, is, this one's connected to this one. It's connected to this one, 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 this one. I did not connect it to this one yet. For people that think this geometry stuff is super easy, uh, this is kind of a humbling one. This is the geometry that keeps shit real. <laughs> so, all right, so now we're gonna basically link up. This one's already got a link here. 
So it's got one here, so I don't need to do it. Got one there, got another one here. It does not have one here. circle here. I hope everyone's had a good week this week. I've had a good week. It's been amazingly busy, like literally every day I had a meeting every hour, I think. Which is kind of insane. I had to complain to my assistant a little bit. <laughs> like, hey, I'm feeling overbooked even while I'm sitting here at home. People ask me a lot, you know, what do I spend my time doing during the day? And, uh, and I'll kind of tell you a normal day for me. Uh, it's certainly not doing this, although lately it's been a lot more of it. Normal day for me is I generally wake up at around 5.30 or 6, depends on what time my kids get up. And um, so I'm just going around this, so this one's already there, there. Okay, so that's there, not one here. So um, I get up and I like to I'm kind of on a health kick lately since this whole thing has, you know, happened with coronavirus. And uh, I went to Egypt, as you might know, about a month and a half ago. And I came back and I never thought that I would be like this, ever. But I don't know, right when I got back from Egypt, like I was repulsed by any kind of meat. <laughs> and uh, I stopped eating meat. It was just like one day to the next. I don't know what happened, but I had no desire. It like made me almost sick to think about it. And it wasn't because I was thinking about, you know, oh, you know, about animals and stuff like that. It wasn't even about that. It was just about, it just sounded so gross to me for some reason. And, you know, I've eaten meat my whole life. But I have to say, um, it has been a dramatic shift for me. And it only about five, six weeks. Also, you know, I'm not going out to dinner and stuff anymore. We stopped going out because we worried about the whole coronavirus thing. And, um, and then of course quarantine came along. So then I started to uh, also not be, I guess, normally I have like dinners out for work and stuff like that. And so I end up, you know, drinking something and so I haven't been drinking either. And just those two things, switching to only eating food at home because you can't really go out. And secondly, to no longer eating meat. I've lost 20 pounds in just like a month and a half. Everything else I've done the same. You know. So I've been uh, exercising more again. And I've got a nice gym at home. So I do that and then, you know, take a shower and get ready and all that stuff like normal. But then I, uh, I usually start my work day at around 7.30 or 8. I come into my office here while I'm in quarantine. Normally I'll be driving to the office. And I usually have meetings all day. Um, and often I get to have you know, meetings that are kind of uh, thinking meetings. So rather than just talking meetings, thinking meetings where there's brainstorming going on. And I'm very lucky I get to work with a whole bunch of really cool guys that, that think uh, the same way, which is a great blessing. And I get to work on projects that are really interesting. You know, I have several different interests and companies 
some in healthcare, some in energy, some in finance. So my day is never boring, I'll say that much, that's for sure. And um, I have lots of conference calls. And usually when I'm not in quarantine, you know, I'll do some stuff as well that relates to community. I was one of the early, I guess, co-founders of uh, the Chamber of Commerce here in Orange County, which is called Octane. It's for high tech, med tech, and uh, clean tech companies. And then I have a very active social life until quarantine also. I'm a member of a group called YPO, so I spend a lot of time with those guys. They're a, a, it's a group of CEOs. Um, you know, when you're a CEO, it's kind of a lonely business. It's not an easy job. And a lot of people don't really realize that. A lot of people say they want to be a CEO. In fact, for people that have been CEO, I don't know that many people that want to be a public company CEO. I've been a public company CEO. That's not very fun, by the way. In fact, I don't think I know anyone who's been a public company CEO who wants to be a public company CEO again. Um, and that's very telling, right? So we're just going around this, keep drawing these lines, and uh, make sure that we don't miss any. And don't draw them really hard either because you're going to want to erase a lot of these later on. And often I go to conferences and stuff, but I really think that everything that's happened with coronavirus is going to change a lot of how we think about going to meetings and conferences and I don't think I'll be traveling to Europe anymore for like one day meetings and stuff like I used to all the time. I used to go to Asia and travel all over the place and do stuff like that and now I don't think I'll be doing that stuff anymore. I definitely think the whole world is going to be impacted and changed by what's happened with this coronavirus thing in such habit forming ways. I think habits are going to change inevitably. And I do think that this is all part and parcel of the next evolution or change for this world. I certainly hope that the world changes to being a, a more, less polarized place, or at least accepting of others' polarities and differences, rather than condemning of them. You've heard me say before, if you spot it, that means you got it, right? So, this is starting to come together now. The things that interest me the most are probably physics and math and the interrelation with music because every time I see it, it reminds me just how incredible this universe is and how there must be a plan. Nothing happens by accident. And just because we don't see the pattern doesn't mean the pattern doesn't exist. In fact, it just means that we haven't found it yet or we haven't looked hard enough. So in general, I think right now I've been kind of feeling like I've been mourning in a way the end of the way I've looked at life, I guess. I mean, there are a lot of things about the paradigm that has been prior to, I guess let's call it, you know, before COVID and after COVID. Um, there are a lot of things about that world that I didn't necessarily align to or like, per se. 
but there's also a lot of things that I did like. So in a way, there's aspects of the innocence and you know, growing up in the world where you don't really think about any of this stuff that, you know, it's like, wow, you know, we're kind of oblivious and now we're shocked into a new reality, right? Totally shocked into a new reality. I think that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this course with you guys. Kind of like reminded me of, you know, after I had my crises in 2015 and 16, I had to reconstruct mathematics. Well, in a way, these classes helped me to reconstruct, deconstruct and reconstruct a, a new paradigm for myself. Okay, so we're getting close here. Just going faster to look to see if there's any ones that I didn't yet draw. Okay, so you can kind of see, sometimes they're there, it's just that I took an eraser over it to clean up the page, which I'm gonna do here in a second again. Okay, and then it kind of got faint. I think the thing I'd love to do now, besides spend time with my kids and family and such, is I'd love to uh, have the time to contemplate, which is not a luxury generally afforded that often, at least in the old world, the before COVID world. So this is really Sometimes it feels somewhat decadent to be able to do this all the time. Now what I do is I try to look to see, just like take a big picture here. And first of all, you'll start noticing this thing is starting to look really three dimensional, right? It's like a, you could say this is like a planet or a ball or something, right? It's like kind of coming out at me already. And, um, but if I look to see where there might be missing points, right? You kind of look at each one of these, it looks like a spider web, right? And You'll notice right away that there's one, there's a few missing here, right? So I'm gonna draw these in. And just think about how making this is this complex and being able to pull out of this <laughs> the complexity of a complete geometric structure in three dimensions is freaking mind blowing to me. That's exactly what we're gonna do. So let's see, did we get all of our lines here nice and clean? And if we don't get finished with this, don't worry because we'll just finish it in the next class. So let's check each one of these. Now you can see how each of these look like planes, right? They've got like a whole plane here of dimension, an entire plane of dimension. So this looks like it's got all the different pieces. Let me make this one a little bit darker. Now just to clean this up, I'm gonna take my eraser. I'm gonna basically put it over this because when you've used the ruler this many times over it, it starts to accumulate junk. So I had some meetings with some people that work formally at the top labs, the NIH, National Institute of Health, as well as uh, CDC, and um, talking about trying to find potential cures and looking at uh, even light-based technologies that might be able to do it. So I was kind of curious knowing that COVID uh, dies as soon as it comes into contact with enough ultraviolet light that I was wondering maybe there might be a way to actually take one of those uh, teeth whitening trays 
and the teeth whitening trays that use ultraviolet light for curing and just put that in your mouth for like a minute or so and see if it would actually kill COVID and other viruses like unto it, like SARS and H1N1 and all that. So I've had meetings about that and um, they asked if I could help them get in touch with the White House on some potential new safe, uh, you know, different kind of, this group in particular is concerned about vaccines in general because they don't like the, they don't like the um, preservatives that are used in vaccines, uh, which include aluminum and mercury, and there's never really been any testing on the cumulative effects of, of the preservatives. Not necessarily the, the challenge with the actives. The actives are just the virus itself. You know, a vaccine for COVID is just gonna be a micro dosing of the COVID virus into the host patient. And hopefully it'll, uh, any vaccine would not have the aluminum and the, uh, the other you know, mercury oriented preservatives, which you know, the FDA never really tests. They test it with one batch. They don't test it with accumulated effects uh, in the body and both mercury and aluminum have kind of well-known accumulated effects. It's a very bizarre industry. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry relating to vaccinations have no liability, strangely enough. They literally have no liability mandated under law for anything that happens to patients that go on to those uh, vaccinations. Okay, so now the next step here is we're going to find our upside down we're going to find our upside down pentagon, our inverted pentagon in the center, right? Because that's going to be an important element of this. So I'm going to say it's going to be this point right here. Okay. And um, that's going to be one above the midpoint line. So each one of these will be at 108 degrees. So this is gonna be at 180 degrees, 108 degrees, at 252 degrees. And then on the bottom ones, and it's gonna be two away from the middle. So one, two, just like that. Okay, now, remember you're looking at a ball here, and this ball is made up of hexagons and pentagons, and I'm now drawing the back side of the ball. Okay, so now that's pretty cool, right? Hmm. So we can even draw a line that comes off of this. I go like this. So let's just draw it to that point. Now imagine this is like a wooden structure that you're looking within right? and you're seeing we're, we're, we're working on the back side of the structure now. now Who would have thought that all these lines is going to make all this? It's kind of nuts. Now normally Anybody, most materialists, scientists, mathematicians would look at all this mess of lines and they would say, oh, there's nothing in there. There's nothing in there. You're crazy. <laughs> well, 
actually, there is something in there. Most definitely. So now we're gonna draw, I'm already starting to see, now if I just focus on this for a moment, I'm actually starting to see a hexagon emerging out of this mess. Can you guys see it? Can you see a hexagon in a dimensional frame? So there would be a hexagon for each side here. There's going to be some hexagon, right? Absolutely. So that means, and I'm not looking on the back side here, I'm working on the front side here. So I know that I've got a line here, right? So there must be some kind of hexagonal line. It's gonna come right here. And I know also that there's gotta be ones that come off of here. So let me fold these up a little bit. Right. It's just looking into the abyss and being able to pull out the structure. Look for the structure. It's there and it's just hiding from you, from your perception. All right. So now you can kind of see there's a frame on this, right? The question is, how long do we make these lines? And you can see that there's a, a hexagonal structure that's coming off of this right, that would basically match up. And does it go all the way up to here? Does it come up to here? And then does it come across here to basically match up? You see this? So this look, look, looks starting to look like a hexagon, right? Now, let's uh, debold this a little bit because sometimes you can't unsee something and then that you have to remove it in order to then see it. There's another metaphor for life. You need to remove something that is in the way of seeing what it is that you're trying to create. And life experience is about creating the reality around you with your own mind, okay? So we know that one of these sides here is going to be linking up here because I basically took the fourth point, so the fourth point here, crossing over this zone right here, right? And did the same thing over here, because look, this line right here is matching up to one, two, three, four, right? And so then the question is, do I go all the way up, right, to this point? Is it right here? So let's test that out, see if that works. And by the same token, it's kind of got the same uh, crisscross point that's going on right over here, right? So it's a little bit longer. Let's see if I'm going to measure this. So it's two and a half inches. That's two and a half inches right there, just as I thought. Okay. So then, if that's the case, then we should be able to link up these two lines right here. There we go. So now we have our first hexagon and it's in perspective. So it's gonna make the ball, it's not like perfect in its shape, but it is perfect in order for you to see this in three dimensions. Isn't that nuts? Crazy, man. Crazy stuff. This geometry, I tell you what. So now, I'm gonna do the same thing here on the other side, right? So I'm gonna take this same two and a half inches Gonna take me up to this point right here. Same type deal, right? And 
the same thing over here. Again, there it is. I'll go ahead and bold these now so we can start to frame this in our own minds. You guys getting excited so because you can now see this thing? Now the truncated icosahedron, the other name for it, is the common soccer ball. And for all the Europeans that are on here, it cracks me up. They're like, you guys don't know what a soccer ball is. <laughs> like, man, we actually play soccer a lot here. I grew up in the UK, so I grew up playing football. So now all we have to do is continue this same structure on the whole front of this thing. And just repeat, keep repeating the structure. Now, for these structures in, on the other side, in order for it to have a three-dimensional look, Right, I'll show you guys how to do that real quick because this is also not an easy thing to do. So now we're gonna have to remember that the, the size and scale of the pentagon is always gonna be smaller than the scale of the hexagon that is adjacent to it. And the differential in size is always going to be, if I was gonna inscribe uh, those pentagons and hexagons within circles, they would have exactly a 1.2 differential between the two. Okay, we're starting to run out of time here, but uh, we've got a few minutes left. We'll finish this with the next, next one we have. Okay, so now, if I were gonna basically find the point where this geometry is now gonna let me um, have a, uh, a full hexagon inside here. I think it's gonna come all the way up to there and there. So this is on the back side of the structure now, right? And by the same token, it's gonna basically take a line that's gonna go probably up like this. And we have to find the cross point line. So I've gotta basically fill in some of the blanks here, but not so easy, but we'll figure it out. be missing a line. Hmm. Why is that one coming? Okay, so this goes to one, two, three, one, two, three. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. And you actually need all these crazy lines that we drew. Okay, there we go. So yeah, you take it up to here. here, which goes, let's see, it comes to the halfway point, it goes a little bit higher than the halfway point, it looks like. So it's going to go right there. Oh, it should go a little bit higher. Okay. But this is the halfway point right here. Let me measure that real quick. There's two and a half. It should be somewhere right in there. That's exactly where it is. Okay. So let's see. Come across this line right here. Or, yeah, it must be. These angles look funky. Yeah, I think that's what it is. You know what I'm gonna do? So 
This gives me another pentagon right inside here. Yeah, this will help me. I'm gonna draw another pentagon line because I know this is part of the framing that's important. Pretty cool how this works. It's so epic how this works. Sometimes we just lose our way because there's so much complexity, and it's like, whoa, how can I see past all of this complexity? And this helps us. So I'm exactly where to take this line to right here. Then I know that it's going to come up to the top part of this. This is where it's going to go. Oh, it always blows my mind because it seems like it's too long. That seems about right, right there. too well. But maybe I can save it anyway because yeah. So go like this. Is that too sharp an angle? Hmm. Oh, my Instagram crowd. Well, looks like we've come up on the hour. We'll have to finish this later. And uh, you can see I've got my cheat thing there, and it's still hard. We'll see you at the next class. See you guys. Bye.